um, honored to come here and speak for you all. Um, I am a dermatologist. I trained at OHSU and then um, joined Northwest Dermatology four years ago. And um, a focus of my practice is hair loss. Um, that's probably about 30% of what I see and dedicate my time to is um, diagnosing and treating um, hair disorders. And, and the rest is, is general dermatology. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you know what lupus is, um, but just as a background, um, you know, it is autoimmune. We still don't know what causes it, but we think there's some combination of hormones, particularly estrogen, genetic risk factors, and some environmental trigger that triggers the onset of the disease. And it can affect lots of different organ systems, but um, there are very many manifestations of the skin. And we'll, I'll show you lots of pictures of different ways lupus can affect your skin. <coughs> Predominantly women is affected and it usually presents during the childbearing years, which is why we think estrogen is um, part of why this gets, or how this gets triggered. And in systemic lupus, the ratio is much higher of women to men. In skin lupus, um, that, that ratio is a little bit more evened out, but still higher in women. And in certain ethnic groups, particularly um, women of African descent, it can be much higher. So there are different kinds of lupus. There is systemic lupus, um, and then there is cutaneous lupus. And pe people can have one or the other or both. And both systemic and cutaneous lupus can have their own set of skin findings. And so these are the different types of lupus we'll be talking about today. So we'll first talk about systemic lupus. And as I said earlier, it affects many different organs, um, skin, kidneys, joints, your brain, lugs, and your circulatory system. And 85% of people with systemic lupus will have a skin sign at some point in their disease. And 20% of the time, a skin finding is, the, is what, how patients get diagnosed as a presenting sign of their disease. And I'm sure you've seen this criteria before, and there, it's always changing, um, but this is kind of the more recent. Um, in order to get diagnosed with systemic lupus, you have to have at least four of these findings. Um, the malar rash, which we'll discuss, a discoid rash, sun sensitivity, mouth or nose, nose ulcers, arthritis in greater than two of your peripheral joints, um, fluid around the heart or lungs, that's called pericarditis, um, and I'm blanking on the one for the lungs, but basically fluid around the hearts and lungs. Um, kidney disease, um, which could be protein in your urine or something called cellular casts, which is something that you can see in a urine specimen. Um, neurologic disorders, so uh, presenting with stroke, sudden onset dis um, depression or psychosis, even seizures. Um, some patients can have sudden onset anemia, low platelet counts, low white, white blood cell counts, um, there are some specific antibodies in your blood that are um, diagnostic for lupus, and those are anti-DNA, anti-smooth muscle, or anti-phospholipid. And then there is this positive anti-nuclear antibody test, which is um, highly specific for lupus. Uh, but there are some patients who have lupus that don't have this, this, um, this test. With systemic lupus, there are some skin manifestations that can appear or be coexistent, but they're not specific for lupus. So um, this is the big long list. Um, you can have, uh, and we'll talk about some of these, but just because a, a patient has this doesn't necessarily mean they have lupus, but it could be a warning sign that they have it. So these. This list of skin conditions can be seen in other autoimmune conditions as well. <coughs> so this by itself does not mean you have lupus. And so these non-specific lesions can appear when your systemic lupus is active and usually go away when it's under better control. Um, so 
as I mentioned, they can be seen in other autoimmune diseases. Um, they're not considered part of the criteria, and if we biopsy these lesions, they're not going to show any specific signs of lupus. So the first one is Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, this is an episodic um, reduction of blood supply to the fingers or toes, usually after there's exposure to cold. And there's a lot of people that have this that don't have lupus. It's, um, the primary form is not associated with any underlying condition, and it affects 20% of the young female population. The secondary form is the kind that is associated with an underlying medical problem, and lupus is one of them, but it also can be seen in systemic sclerosis and some other autoimmune diseases. And the treatment for that really is, um, is to uh, keep the hands warm. Um, this tends to be more of a problem in climates similar to Portland, where it's damp, cold, um, through the majority of the winter and in places where there's longer winters, places like the UK, um, Northeast as well. So keeping the hand warm, um, topical, topical nitroglycerin helps dilate the blood vessels so they're not constricting. Um, there are some blood pressure medications that keep the blood vessels dilated. They're called calcium channel blockers. And believe it or not, Viagra has had some success in treating Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, vasculitis, um, there's two forms of vasculitis that can be seen in lupus. One is the small vessel vasculitis, and that it, vasculitis means inflammation of the blood vessels. Um, vasculitis, there's hundreds of things that can cause vasculitis, but one of those things is um, having an underlying autoimmune disease like lupus. And the inflammation <coughs> that's in your body can cause inflammation in the blood vessel lining as well, which causes blood to leak out of those vessels. So you get these um, kind of bruise-like lesions, usually on the legs. Um, and when your lupus is getting better, these lesions tend to go away. Um, this urticarial vasculitis looks identically like hives. So they, but the way that they differ is on biopsy, because you'll see inflammation of blood vessels. And um, they don't itch, they're usually very tender, and they usually last more than 24 hours, where a typical hive will only last a few hours. Uh, there's this other, it's sort of a form of vasculitis, it's called livido reticularis, and patients will have kind of this net-like purplish pattern on their legs. It's sort of like, the Raynaud's phenomenon, there's a form that's not associated with any underlying conditions, um, and it occurs in response to cold weather. But the secondary form can be seen in other autoimmune diseases, such as lupus. And again, it, it could be a sign of vasculitis. Um, there are circulating immune complexes in your bloodstream that sometimes can obstruct vessels and <coughs> give this net-like pattern. And if it's ongoing, these changes actually can be permanent. Uh, some patients will present with ulcers in their mouth, um, in their nose, or even in the genital area when um, lupus is active. Um, and these are really nonspecific, a lot of times not painful, and they differ from discoid mucosal lesions. They, they, they look different and they behave differently as well. And then some people, when they have uh, a systemic lupus flare, they'll start getting blisters. So it's called the bullous eruption of lupus. And that, again, um, goes away once um, the systemic lupus is under better control. And then I saved the alopecia for the, the second part of our, the talk, but we'll, so we'll be addressing that. So now we'll talk about cutaneous lupus. And so these are um, rashes that are specific to lupus. Um, and the first, and the way that it's classified really is in part a way that it looks under the microscope as well. So in acute cutaneous lupus, there is actually, and that's the first box, 
and that's, um, I'll, I'll go over the, the skin findings, but you, there's actually very little inflammation and it's very superficial. And then subacute cutaneous, there's a little bit more inflammation, um, but it's still superficial in the skin. When you get into discoid, which is the third one, there's a lot more inflammation and it's superficial and deep and it surrounds the hair follicles. Lupus tumidus is, is a deeper process, and then lupus paniculitis, the inflammation is all the way down in the fat. So that's kind of what is happening at the <coughs> histologic level when we look at these lesions um, under the microscope. So the first one is a, acute cutaneous lupus. So this is the, that, the classic butterfly rash that a lot of people get. Um, sometimes, uh, ulcers are, are flaring and there's some widespread lesions as well. This is usually a transient rash lasting days to weeks, oftentimes follows sun exposure, usually goes away without leaving any permanent scarring. Um, and it does flare with systemic lupus and is a diagnostic sign of systemic lupus. The thing that it can closely resemble, and sometimes I get consults for this is it can resemble rosacea quite closely. So it's in a very similar distribution. Rosacea usually has pustules, little pus bumps associated with it, um, and there's usually no systemic symptoms with rosacea. And these are some other forms of acute cutaneous lupus with a malar rash, but it also can present as a diffuse rash on the trunk or extremities also. The next one is this subacute cutaneous. So this one is a little bit different. So it actually spares the face, the central face, and can appear on the side of the face. Um, but the part of the body that's the most affected is the upper trunk and upper arms. And these lesions are very characteristic. They're red, they're raised, they're annular, meaning ring-like, and um, usually they have a central clearing and a scaly border. Um, and after they heal, some, sometimes there's a temporary pigment alteration. Usually does not scar. Um, sometimes can be associated with systemic lupus, but this can present just in the skin and not in the whole body. So th these are one of the um, types of lupus that can be skin only. And then Things that resemble this can be things like ringworm and um, certain forms of psoriasis. And these are more pictures of subacute cutaneous lupus. So you can see these ring-like scaly patches, mostly on the trunk with septal clearing. Discoid lupus, um, this is the most common skin manifestation of lupus. Affects the face, scalp, ears, oftentimes related to sun exposure also, um, but you can get mucosal lesions in the lips, eyelids, the genital area also. Lesions are scaly. There's oftentimes pigment change that happens. Um, red, red vessels called telangiectasias. Um, and when they heal, they can heal with something called atrophy, so a, a depression in the skin, and as, as well as scarring. And these patients, most of the time, it just stays in the skin, but there is a, a five to 15% chance that you can develop at some point systemic lupus, or it can be present at the time of diagnosis. And that risk is higher if you have more widespread lesions. <coughs> and these are some more pictures of discoid lupus. Um, it really likes inside of the ear, we call that the conchal bowl, um, that's a, it's a very specific area that it can um, affect. The face and scalp is probably the most common, but rarely you can get these mucosal lesions in the eye, and this is a picture of how it sometimes can heal with um, the atrophy and hypopigmentation. And then these are oral uh, discoid lesions. Um, the thing that's important about this, if you're getting lesions in your mouth, is you. Um, there's an increased risk of these lesions turning into skin, a type of skin cancer called squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and if you biopsy these, they look very specific for lupus. This is a very rare form of lupus. It's called tumid lupus erythematosus. Um, the inflammation is deeper 
and um, there's usually no surface change on the skin with these this, this rash. Um, it's pretty smooth um, and they look more hive-like um, seen on the, the trunk as well and these do not scar so these will, will go away without any permanent skin changes. And then there's lupus profundus so that's the one where the inflammation is all the way down in the fat um, and these uh, lesions are firm, red, raised um, bumps, basically. And they really favor upper arms, upper trunk, and then the breast and buttock area and thighs. And you can have, and you can have different types of these, um, of cutaneous lupus. So this can be seen in a patient who also has discoid lesions as well. It just, in that particular area, the inflammation is much deeper. Um, this one can heal with permanent changes, so it can heal, heal with something called atrophy where the skin kind of sinks down a bit, um, which can lead to some disfigurement because it oftentimes involves a larger area. Um, so the picture on the right, that's where it's more active. It's this kind of, kind of large, deep um, swelling on the hip. And then the, in the other pictures, you can see where they've healed, but they leave this depression in the skin, and that's called atrophy. So to diagnose cutaneous lupus, what we do is biopsy. And we biopsy, we do two types of biopsy. One is a standard biopsy, where we stain it with hematoxylin and eosin. And then there's another one um, that can be very helpful, especially if the first biopsy is not diagnostic called a direct immunofluorescence. In the di direct immunofluorescence, you're actually staining for specific antibodies in the skin, and there's a very specific pattern that shows up that's diagnostic for lupus. And so this is what a routine slide would show. Um, the first one is uh, acute lupus, and you can see that the inflammation is um, pretty superficial. So if you've never looked at a skin biopsy, I'll, go, I'll just kind of go over the, the, the basics. Um, this kind of weave-like area up here is called the stratum corneum. And then this is, um, this whole kind of pinkish area is called the dermis. And then this purplish area is called the epidermis. Um, so the inflammation, and then this is called the dermal epidermal junction here, this line that separates um, the epidermis from, from the dermis. So in lupus, the inflammation is usually hanging out right here in the, um, in the epidermal dermal junction. And, um, and that's for acute, acute cutaneous. In discoid lupus, you can see that the inflammation is much, much more um, prominent, but it also goes a lot deeper and can infiltrate around um, hair follicles and um, other structures in the skin. And this is that direct immunofluorescent staining, and um, it stains for antibodies. And all those antibodies, like I said, this is that dermal epidermal junction, and that lights up in a very specific pattern for um, cutaneous lupus. <coughs> there are some, some other variants of lupus um, that I just wanted to show you. Um, there's a, um, uh, an entity called lupus chilblains, or lupus pernio which resembles chilblains. Um, it, when, and that's when you get lesions on your fingers or toes or sometimes the nose in cold, cold moist climates. Um, and you can get these red or dusky uh, purple, purplish lesions. Sometimes they can form ulcers. And if you buy FCM, they, they show changes specific for lupus. And there's an entity called neonatal lupus. So these um, so these lesions present in the neonatal period of babies and um, the mother may or may not have lupus but for sure the one thing that they do have are antibodies anti-rho, anti-la or this anti-RNP and those antibodies are transferred to the baby um, um, in utero and they're the ones that develop the rash, even though the mother may not have a, any symptoms at all. Um, and they actually go away without any scarring. They're usually these ring-like um, lesions on the face and scalp. Um, but there are some complications that can occur in that neonatal period. Uh, one is called heart block. 
and they also can have liver problems and low platelets, which usually go away. And these are some other pictures of neonatal lupus. And then there's something called drug-induced lupus, and so there are some medications that can bring on lupus-like symptoms, and, um, and especially if you are have the right, um, if you're sort of genetically, have the right genetics for lupus, this is more common. Um, you may present with drug-induced lupus with, with these medications. The one I've seen and that dermatologists prescribe a lot is minocycline. We prescribe this for acne and rosacea and some other things. And so this is one thing that I counsel patients about when I put them on, if they ever develop you know, some of the signs of lupus, um, that they need to stop the medication. And then there is uh, other medications that can cause a rash that looks identical to subacute cutaneous lupus. Um, and these are blood pressure medications mostly. Terbenafine is Lamisil, which we use to treat toenail fungus and other things. Um, and then some biologic drugs. And the rash goes away in about six months after discontinuing the medication. So the way we treat lupus, number one, you know, is, is, is photo protection. A lot of um, the ra uh, skin rashes associated with lupus come on with some sun exposure. So we recommend, um, you know, um, at minimum wearing sun sunscreen, sunblock, SPF 30 or greater, broad spectrum. Um, the mineral sunblocks, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, I think are better. Um, and then there is the UPF clothing, and you know, just, uh, those are widely available now. And the garments that are t um, tighter, darker, often offer better protection. Um, they have ratings, and just to go over that, a UPF rating of 50 will allow 1 50th or 2% of the sun's UV to pass through the skin, so it offers very good protection. SPF 30 um, will also block 98% um, of UVB. Um, and then uh, avoiding the sun, so avoiding the sun during peak hours of the day, and um, because uh, patients with lupus are not seeking sun, vitamin D and calcium supplementation are important because you're not getting those through um, UV light. Um, skin makeup and camouflaging, you know, Helen's going to be talking about this also. Um, but it's helpful in, in patients where the disease activity has, has subsided, but there's often times this dispigmentation that resolves, whether it's skin darkening or skin lightening. So you can use cause makeup as, as a cosmetic camouflage um, to mask some of those skin changes, which sometimes are permanent, sometimes are, are, um, are temporary. And one product that we recommend is Derma Blend. Medically, um, the way we treat uh, skin lupus, um, if it's limited, we'll use topical steroids for, for flares. Um, this is not a good long-term treatment, so we usually like to taper topical steroids over a couple of weeks. If it's something that's tending to come back right away, then we try to switch them to these non-steroidal topical medications called Protopic or Elodil, and those are safer for long-term use. Um, sometimes if a lesion is isolated, we could inject a little bit of steroid into it, and that can um, calm, down, calm down the lesion. Sometimes um, Permanently, um, but many many people have to go on systemic medication because they have systemic disease. And still, the gold standard first line are the anti-malarial drugs, and that's hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil. Um, and then there are other um, anti-malarial drugs that can be used in combination: chloroquine and quinacrine. And if the anti-malarial drugs fail, then um, there are other systemic anti-inflammatory medications. Um, the oral retinoids or vitamin A derivatives, serotonin or isotretinoin, thalidomide. Um, there are immunosuppressive drugs called uh, Celsept or Imuran. Um, there are systemic steroids and sulfasalazine and clofazamine.